Today, we are thrilled to have Fadumo Robinson, Associate Chief Nursing Officer and Collaborative Care Lead, Health Profession Strategy and Practice for Alberta Health Services here to help us learn more about the Internationally Educated Nurses Project. I will now turn things over to Fadumo for her presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I needed that help. Uh, I am I'm glad, I'm honoured to be here today uh, to share this information with you. Bear with me, please. I am going to share my screen. What I would like to do today is um, maybe uh, give you a little bit of context on um, the issue of internationally educated nurses and the recruitment uh, of this group of nurses. I think it's important to understand where we are in a health workforce. We are um, facing um, a shortage across the board of all healthcare workers, not just nurses. Nurses happen to be uh, the largest clinical group in healthcare. However, we're facing a shortage of uh, clinicians across the board. And many of you know this already in your communities. This is not an Alberta problem. This is a national and international issue. Uh, there are many reasons for that shortage. Um, we probably don't have enough time today to talk about it, but I think it's really important to understand that the shortage we're seeing, the challenges we're seeing are uh, national and international. There is also a uniqueness to this particular shortage uh, when it comes to nursing. We actually have more nurses in Alberta now than we've ever had in the history of the province, yet we're still short. There are again number of explanations. Um, some of it is that uh, new graduates are not um, taking positions. They're sticking to urban areas. They're sticking to more part-time or casual positions. And of course, when you have um, majority of your graduates being interested in a non uh, full time FTE for every full time position you need you need multiple nurses to fill that position in casual or part time Alberta Health Service already hires 95% of Alberta graduates so that's another important fact um, so knowing that there is a national and an and international health workforce a shortage, knowing that we already hire uh, 95% of uh, Alberta graduates, we decided to look at what are the options, what do we need to do? So what we have done is actually look at our workforce and we put together a, a workforce strategy to address the challenges. That includes growing our talent, so increasing the supply of nurses, um, optimizing our workforce. It's not only bringing more people, it's how you're utilizing the people you have. Are you facilitating uh, all clinicians and all roles to work to their full scope of practice or full, uh, full role description? So that work is underway where we're ensuring we remove any policies, uh, uh, culture issues that hold people back from practicing to their full scope of practice. So you'll see uh, LPNs doing what their uh, uh, scope and, and what they're legislated to do, RNs doing what they're legislated to do. You'll see more RNs prescribing in Alberta. That's because they are allowed legislatively to pr prescribe in certain limited settings. You'll see healthcare aides uh, performing duties that the role uh, is allowed to perform. We're also looking at retention. How do we retain the staff we are bringing in? And this is where I believe the um, RPAB and our communities uh, can, and can help us. Retention, what retention is and the definition of retention has changed especially when we're talking about in rural communities. Uh, definitely, the employer has uh, um, a huge responsibility and accountability for retention. 
but it's a partnership that community involvement and connection is critical in retaining clinicians in rural communities. So we have this workforce uh, strategy established because we know recruitment alone is not going to solve our, our problem. The other notable piece of information is in Alberta, we have really very collaborative relationships we work very closely together, whether it's the um, post-secondary institutions, employers, government, regulators, to ensure we have the health workforce uh, we need and uh, that we are removing all barriers. So we work you know, with um, Alberta government, uh, we work with um, our regulators, and uh, there is a uh, um, shared vision to ensure our populations are uh, cared for and people have access uh, to health care where they live. So some of those things are, before I move to the IEN, that I'd like to highlight is that there are a number of initiatives in, in terms of Grow Your Own. So a number of you may be familiar with the U of C partnership, University of Calgary partnership with Wayne Wright, where um, they carved out some seats from their program to create a um, uh, baccalaureate program uh, at that um, in that area. There's another one in uh, north around the Cold Lake area. We have transitional grad nurse um, programs that support um, grad nurses with additional uh, um, orientation and mentorship. We have uh, a huge student uh, nurse employment program that starts when um, RNs, uh, students are in their second year as a healthcare aide, and then they can move to as an undergraduate nurse employee after their third year. We have also established a number of paid preceptorships in rural areas to attract um, graduating nurses to, um, to experience in rural area without the financial hardship uh, that could have uh, having a student move from urban area to rural area while they're still a student and not earning. This particular um, piece of um, um, attracting um, graduates to rural area is a really important one. Uh, not all of them stay, but good number of them stay. And the fact that they're exposed to rural uh, means that um, they may actually come back to rural. Some, some of these students are from rural area and they're given opportunity for a paid preceptorship to come home. Others, it's uh, really they're curious and, and just maybe don't have the financial means and um, that exposure, that supported exposure um, is, um, is exactly what they need. So we uh, just uh, uh, issued 20 or 51 uh, uni hybrids and uh, are working on the winter session, uh, hoping to reach about 80 uh, in, in at least 15 different communities. We also have created um, uh, in-house HCA healthcare aid program because we know some of the rural areas don't have access to certified healthcare aids. So we actually are... Uh, created this program where the sites can hire a local uh, community member who is interested in this field but doesn't have the certificate and we will put them through that certificate. We're partnering with a couple of uh, colleges so the individual can work uh, part-time or full-time as they study and we have tutors that assist them and their certificate once they graduate is going to be from Northwest or Northern Lakes College and they can earn as they learn. And, and this is, again, another initiative to support rural. So let's talk about the internationally educated nurses. Uh, historically, uh, it's been very difficult for internationally educated nurses to qualify um, and, and uh, gain credentialing in Canada. Um, it's been many, many research done on these, many, many recommendations made over the years, and often more than 50% of internationally educated nurses who arrive in our, in our shores would end up working in different roles, healthcare aides, LPNs, and some of them would leave healthcare uh, entirely. When we were undertaking this uh, recruitment, we did extensive research 
we've reviewed more than 1200 uh, um, articles. We did environmental scan. We surveyed 750 IENs already working in Alberta Health Service. We worked with our three regulatory nursing colleges. We worked with the National Nursing Assessment to ensure that the pathway we were creating to recruit internationally educated nurses achieved a couple of things. One, that we brought nurses, IENs, who would meet the requirement. Number two, these IENs would have the nursing experience and scope to support in our work environments. This is particularly critical. One, we are our work um, um, involved partnership with the regulatory colleges, as well as what um, is the single source of entry uh, for nursing credentialing in Canada, and that's the National Nursing Assessment. Before I move on and, and walk you through the process, I like to just um, cr uh, create some clarity about um, IENs. When we talk about IENs in Alberta, uh, really, you can divide the IENs into two buckets. The first group is the overseas IENs. That's the group I'm going to talk about. That's the group we're recruiting. The others can be, uh, um, there are a number of uh, categories, but it's really what we normally call domestic domestic IENs. So these are individuals who are living in Canada, uh, but who were educated overseas. And they can be divided into three groups. So just because when you hear IENs, we're not always talking about the same group. Um, you can have IEN who has been assessed to require bridging program. And uh, to date, the only bridging program uh, we have is Mount Royal. And these IENs would have done about eight months worth of bridging. Uh, they graduate, they obtain, they write the exam, and they become RNs. It's about 120 of them a year. There has been significant change in how IENs are credentialed in Alberta since April of this year. So these numbers have changed a bit, but there is a small group of IENs who meet most requirements but are lacking um, uh, some, and they get a uh, permit that's conditional. They're a very small number. Uh, we normally support them with that con condition. Once the condition is removed, usually they have to have supervised practice. Um, then the condition is removed and they're like any other RN. The bulk of domestic IENs are individuals who have qualified um, uh, without these additional conditions, but some of them could have significant gaps in their practice. And some of them could have been working as LPNs. So that is when you hear uh, IENs, there are these different categories of IEN. So today, just for clarity, I'll be talking about the IENs that are coming from overseas. So our process for recruitment, as I said, started with quite a bit of research to ensure that IENs we're bringing to Canada can meet the requirement, number one. Number two, have the breadth and depth of experience to work in our rural environments. Our pipeline, posting pipeline, uh, and efforts have been focused on rural thus far. There are candidates that throughout the interviews we interview and we think they're more appropriate for urban, uh, one here, one there, but primarily majority of our efforts are for rural recruitment. We then screen the candidates. We screen the candidates for education. We look at in detail the type of education they had to ensure it meets the generalist education of a Canadian nurse. So making sure they have med surge, obstetrics, community, mental health, and so on and so forth. We look at their licensure. We look at their experience uh, to ensure that um, the experience they're bringing is appropriate for the environment we're recruiting. We then send them for assessment. They have to get through the assessment and meet the requirement before we would consider them for a job. Once they meet the requirement, once they obtain a license, we then interview them and interview them for a specific area. 
even at that point, we walk away from candidates if the interview is not successful and we don't see the kind of competency we're looking for for these rural areas. Once the candidate completes the interview successfully, we then send them off to immigration. We've collaborated with Alberta government and these candidates would be uh, nominated for um, um, Alberta uh, nomination. Um, they'll receive a nomination letter for immigration, which then uh, helps to expedite that process. The IENs, pardon me, the IENs then uh, would arrive and receive, and I'll speak to that, um, extensive orientation. Um, and uh, there will be a community integration. And that's where I think there's a huge partnership between AHS and uh, various uh, rural communities. The IENs uh, that we have are coming from many, many different countries. We've had applicants from the US, Jamaica, UK, Nigeria, South Africa, India, Philippines, and Australia. Majority of the candidates are these countries that are labeled here, but we also have um, many, two, three, four, five from different countries, good number from the Middle East. Our process is a very high touch process, again, because of the competition, national competition, we ensure we're working very closely with these IENs and, and um, in, in, as they walk through this, this process. Here are some of the uh, sites that have been matched thus far. That doesn't mean the candidates have arrived. Um, this just means um, some are in immigration, some are in finalizing job offer state, and so forth. Uh, but majority of them are going to the North Zone. I would say about 65% of thus far the matches that have been made are going to um, going to the North Zone and then uh, Central Zone. And we're just starting on South. So here is just another version of what I've shared in where the applicants are coming from. This doesn't mean it's Everybody you see here is shortlisted, but it just gives you uh, um, an understanding and an appreciation of how many people are applying from everywhere in the world. So I want to talk about a little bit about the orientation. The IENs, all of them will arrive in Edmonton. They will get two weeks of robust orientation um, to set up a number of things, um, and then they will go to their um, communities, assigned communities, uh, where they will then get uh, program and site orientation would be matched with a mentor. Um, that orientation could take, you know, a couple of months, depending on the area of specialty. Some areas of specialty in, in uh, Alberta require additional education, such as the OR or critical care. Even though you have OR background and critical care background, they have to have additional certification. So we do that. Um, and then they go into their full role uh, and they get a mentor assigned for uh, that first year uh, to help them really just kind of navigate through nursing in Canada. We support them with housing for the first three months. Um, housing is becoming extremely difficult and I am afraid this is going to be um, the one um, barrier for uh, rural. Uh, because if we can't find housing, I don't know what we're going to do. So we really, really need partnership with the community because we know uh, all housing assets are not advertised. Um, they receive an extensive package and thanks to our partnership with our PAP, there are some beautiful community profiles that we have. We give it to candidates um, and, um, you know, many, many other things of what they might need in that community. Uh, our team does some work, additional work to, you know, make sure that if there are religious, you know, uh, um, churches and in particular uh, interests they have that we include in the package. Um, the orientation is divided into uh, three kind of phases, and I won't bore you with the details of it, but essentially uh, it's broken up uh, into kind of initial phase, uh, mid phase, and then uh, sort of a final phase uh, of the orientation. Even though these IENs are coming in with uh, hand-picked experience and education, and really we feel they're 
cream of the crop type candidates, we actually ask them all to complete additional education just to make sure. And um, that education is all um, uh, pre-required, uh, pre-arrival uh, uh, before the orientation. We uh, do further assessments to make sure, you know, even very experienced nurses could have uh, certain gaps uh, to identify those gaps and make sure we put uh, some support in place um, and uh, simulation and skill labs and um, uh, mentorship, monthly mentorship meetings and things like that um, but to help not only the IENs, but actually to help managers and educators uh, to understand um, what the needs might be and how they can meet that need. I'm going to stop here and actually talk a little bit about um, the community integration. When we talk about IE and recruitment, there are two types of integrations. There's the clinical integration, which is what the orientation is meant to do. You know, yes, you could be emergency nurse in, um, I don't know, in the Philippines um, or India, but the equipment you use, the work processes you use, um, the team dynamics are all different. And um, that takes time to actually understand uh, some of our workflows and our po policies and procedures and protocols. And there are tons and tons and tons of protocols um, and, and understanding that and understanding our equipment and procedures. Um, so that's the clinical integration. And we have a really robust clinical integration. But there's also non-clinical integration, which is how that IEN is going to fit in that team. Is the team going to be welcoming? How that IEN is going to fit in, in the community? Will they be welcome? How about their spouse and kids? These are huge, huge factors in whether these IENs will stay in the communities for a long time. We have worked with our union partners to have return on service uh, of 30 months, but our hope is that these candidates stay for good. And the only way to make that happen is actually to have um, to have partnerships with communities uh, to assist with housing and community connection and welcoming the candidates. Um, uh, you know, we need things like who would pick up the candidate when we um, when we uh, when they arrive in the town. Could could there be somebody to show them around? The candidates are coming and they don't drive. They have to obtain a driver's license. Um, could we get help with that? Um, even shopping, how we shop is very different. Uh, could there be a community member who can help them navigate that uh, in, in you know, preparing for the winter and how we shop in our small communities? Um, so th that, that kind of partnership is really, I think, critical in, in uh, making these candidates uh, feel home. And, and stay and stay with us and become part of our communities. So I think I'm gonna stop there, Lindsay and uh, Shanda, and I'm gonna take down um, the slide so I can see people's faces and see if there are any questions. As we're waiting for people to kind of um, get around to the Q&A, this is really, really exciting uh, because what, what we have created, it, it normally, you know, um, when you're recruiting internationally educated nurses, you go through agency and you don't know really who you're getting and have people been told the truth about where they're going and things like that. And because we're actually doing this recruitment ourselves uh, directly, um, we our first conversation is about highlighting rural communities. And um, we have numerous videos about some of them actually are PAPS videos about nursing in rural Alberta and what, what is that like? And, um, and making sure the candidates understand uh, and are prepared as much as you can humanly be prepared. Um, and that have, as I said, uh, the experience to succeed. Um, so uh, we're really excited about that, um, that, that it's structured that way. We've had candidates that when we match them, they look up the community and they say, you know, sorry, not for me. And that's completely fine. We better, you know, it's better to know upfront than after they arrive. 
Um, so, you know, it's it's a rural recruitment, and here's what nursing in rural Alberta is like. And um, this is the kind of support we'll give you, and this is the kind of experience you need. So it's all all upfront. But I think, as you can appreciate, it is um, it is not easy to bring uh, to pick up the pieces and leave your family, your friends, your familiar environment and go to uh, a place that's completely unknown. There's no matter what, it takes a certain courage uh, to do that. Um, and even when you have uh, support, there's an element of isolation and, and uh, uh, transition that's required. And, and that's where we think really a good uh, partnership between employer and, and community is critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fidumo. We do have three questions here. So okay. I'll start with the first one. Uh, the first one is, how successful has the program been so far in the communities? And are the nurses passing probation? So we're very early in the process. We just have 10 that have arrived. And thus far, um, so we had one candidate resign. Um, he was matched to, he came from Australia and was matched to a very small community. And uh, it didn't work out, so he resigned. We have nine still in place. And so far, we're hearing nothing but uh, great accolades from leadership about their skills and whatnot. So we are very hopeful uh, that they will pass um, probation. Mm -hmm. And are you able to touch on some of the IENs that have made it to their communities and how they're doing? So uh, we had um, three IENs um, arrive in August. We, call, we, we, we termed them as arriving off cycle because we actually were hoping all of them will arrive in September. So three arrived in, um, in August. Two of them have settled in Panoka, one uh, at Rimpi. And uh, there was a little bit of a, a hiccup initially. Uh, and the hiccup is around driving because as you know, no transportation in, in most rural communities and the IENs are not coming in with cars or, or even driver's license. So arranging transportation was a bit hiccup and co will continue to be a hiccup. Uh, but, you know, teams stepped up, people offered um, to drive uh, when an individual um, was able to buy a car immediately. But um, honestly, <laughs> These candidates, and it depends, you know, sometimes it depends on the maturity of the candidate and, and whatnot, but these initial three were uh, all mature candidates who were looking for a long time to come and, and just found this opportunity um, with us. And uh, we think we really matched them well and we're very excited about those candidates uh, staying on. Um, the other six are, there's a one candidate in Edmonton um, that was um, OR background and an only OR background, so we put him in where he was needed. Um, the other candidates went to Edson. One candidate went to Edson, one went to Slave Lake, um, High Prairie, and Fairview. And these candidates just started at the beginning of October. Um, just had a conversation with a couple of them yesterday, and they're transitioning. They're transitioning really well. Again, the housing and the transportation, and they want to bring their, oh, my apology, and one candidate at Peace River. So um, all of these candidates actually left kids behind um, and are anxious to bring their young families and um, are noticing there are not too many there are limited options for housing. So that's creating a little bit of anxiety, as you can appreciate, but they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. We do have quite a few questions. Uh, okay, now. let's so, get through so let's, them. Let's, let's I'll be quick it. answering them awesome. too. No problem. Uh, the next one is, will the nurses be connected with a settlement agency? That's a fantastic um, idea. And, um, you know, if you have ideas, please let us know. Uh, in previous life, uh, before I became a nurse, I was um, actually a social worker and did uh, some settlement. Most settlement agencies are in big cities um, and um, <clears throat> they tend to focus on uh, folks who are having a hard time getting employment settlement and integration. Um, these candidates, I, I'm not sure are what I know to be settlement agency work will work for these candidates, but you know, I'm open. So 
I really, if you could please reach out to, um, if you have information you'd like to share, please um, share it with RPAP and we, we would love to take it from there. And thanks, Fadimo. Uh, next question is, what type of wages and who pays? Is it Alberta Health? I'm assuming that will be a union. Yeah, so their wage, of course, they're employees of Alberta Health Service. We bring them, we offer them a job and bring them. So they are being paid as an Alberta Health Service employee. And the wages are, of course, based on our collective agreement with UNA. Depends on how many years of experience mm -hmm. they have and whatnot. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so we have three questions that are very similar. So I'm going to try attempt to summarize all three of them together. Um, it's basically on um, when communities can expect to know when an when an IEN is going to be arriving in their community. When mm -hmm. will when can they see their biographies? Um, how far in advance? Uh, just timelines around that. There's some technical side to this. So the IENs go off to immigration, and then the minute they get their immigration uh, um, work permit approved, we actually book them um, within 30 days. So we we can book them until they have the work permit. We've realized that if they're bringing up their family, 30 days is not enough. So for those who are bringing families, we're going to change that to um, 30 to 60 days. Um, but we can't wait longer than that because they have a permit there, you know, that is going to run out of time otherwise. So um, once we have confirmation, they've they've been booked, we can share that information. And uh, it's of course, it involves the consent, uh, obtaining consent to share their information. But we have profiles that we've created for each candidate to, to share. And we can absolutely share that um, at that time. And I think that probably the best way to do that is to bring the manager and the community, if there's a community support identify, to bring the manager and the community support together and then share the, um, the profiles that way. So about a month before, roughly, mm -hmm. is all we can do. Yeah, and in terms of involvement with RPAP, because I know that we have had um, direct contact with some of the community integration team with Alberta Health Services when they know mm -hmm. IENs will be going. Um, we will generally ask those communities to have a community leader uh, identified, which we will share with Alberta Health Services to assist in that integration piece. So the farthest out that we've seen that information come through is about six the weeks better. prior to their arrival. Yeah, and, and I think my team is on the call now. We definitely, we know we have seven in for November confirmed, so we can we can start sharing that information for sure. Great, yeah. And then I guess in terms of their biographies, would that be a month as well, Fidumo, where the I would say and that? I would say about that. So okay. um, Paula and Aileen, I'm hoping you're both on the call. I did see Paula. I think we just have to make sure we have consent to share those biographies, and then we should be able to share them as soon as we're giving the information about the arrival. How and where do the applicants complete the additional education prior to arrival in Canada? Yeah, um, a good question. So we, um, there are um, some really high quality um, it, uh, courses that are designed for IENs online that are free. So we connect them with that. It's called Next Gen University. Mm -hmm. Is there feedback from IENs for what their biggest learning curve was in integrating to rural? Yes, there will be. And we have a really good evaluation process. So we evaluate the whole process. We evaluate, you know, the <clears throat> support and interaction prior to arriving. We evaluate the uh, orientation. And then we're going to evaluate at, uh, at the 12 month junction. Uh, to see, you know, now that they have reflected on the whole process to see what we need to improve. But again, uh, there's been tons of research done on uh, internationally educated nurses and um, what the key pain points are is known. Of course, there's always uniqueness to that, 
but um, and uh, so we we build that into the process. How we design our orientation is based on that. But we also surveyed about 750 IENs that work for Alberta Health Service, and we you know good number of them were from rural, and we've got some really good tips from them as to what helps. And and the the three key things that have been identified in the literature, in uh, from hearing from the IENs uh, who who are here already. Is number one an IEN a specific orientation and integration, mentorship, and community support and connection? Those are the three key pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very similar to just retention, right? Yeah. But what we exactly. Yeah. All right. Next question is: Will the IEN be only connected with the CNEs through AHS facilities? Or will there be engagement with local colleges if there is one in that particular community? Well, um, initially, they're connected with a clinical guide that has been identified. So what colloquially might be called a buddy, except it's a more substantive role. So they'll have a clinical guide mentor assigned to them for their uh, orientation phase. They're connected to their CNE, of course. They're connected to our team. We have an, a clinical integration team. They're connected to that team. But in terms of college, you, you know, interestingly enough, many of these IENs are actually highly educated and are very interested in further development and what is the opportunity for developing as a rural nurse. And we're so excited to share with them now. There's so many programs, certificates and courses you can take while still in rural. So absolutely. Um, but I think some of that just in, to face it would likely be um, something that they outreach to, uh, but there's tons of support around them other than that. Next question, is there an exit interview of some sort when providers resign and are these questions standard and address things like structural racism and belonging? Yeah, yeah. So we've um, we've always had an exit uh, interview and now we've actually expanded to be um, a transition um, interview because being a large organization, somebody might leave a particular area, but not the organization. So we're now looking at why are you leaving, say, um, Fairview and coming to Edmonton? So we're looking at that internal uh, churn as well. Um, I think there are questions that I uh, tease out if inclusion was a problem. Um, I'm not sure I would I, I have to honestly take that away and see if the question is specifically about racism, but there are definitely questions that ask about inclusion and, and feeling included and fitting in and connection and those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is how are the candidates assigned to their community? Yeah, really good question. So that is actually number one, uh, one of the priorities for us. Um, we look at experience. So number one is experience. So if an area high level is a really good example or or uh, St. Paul or Cold Lake, areas where we have large uh, uh, obstetrics labor and delivery program, we wanna make sure that's, that's the kind of knowledge that takes many years to develop. So we wanna make sure the, the nurses, the IENs are coming in with that background. So if, if somebody's coming in with, you know, 10 years of L&D, we're going to put them in a site that has lots of L&D. Uh, in fact, many of these candidates are coming in with an RN as, a, as well as a midwifery degree. So that's mm. fantastic. So that's number one. Number two, we're looking at, um, especially when we're matching more than one candidate, we're looking at how they support each other. So we may, let's say if we're looking at their, I'm going to use high level again, if high level has a couple of vacancies we're filling, we're going to look at candidates that have maybe complementary experience so they can support each other. Also, can we find candidates that are from the same background? Because again, that's going to make that transition really much easier um, if they have each other and essentially. So that's, that's another factor we look for um, sites where we have only one candidate uh, or two candidates. Um, we're then looking at candidates who can um, 
who's more likely to succeed in going into a small community by themselves. So we're looking at someone who has a family, for example, rather than a single person. Maybe we look at somebody a bit more mature rather than somebody early in their career. So it's not an exact science. It's, it's a bit of science, bit of magic, bit of art, but um, that's uh, we look at those factors. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, what does the process look like to ensure that community and practical integration happens in practice? Who ensures managers are implementing the strategic plan for this initiative? Yeah, fantastic question again. Um, so our program, which is leading this initiative, is connected to that site for a year. So we're running a number of community of practices for managers and CNEs and uh, clinical guides and, and the IEN. So we're connected to ensure the support is there and the support continues. So, and there will be hiccups as and where there's a human, there's going to be problems and that's just part of it. So we're not thinking there will be no problems or, or, or hiccups or gaps. We're, we're putting a process in place though where we can identify that and, and address it immediately. Um, and uh, the community integration piece is really where, again, we're just seeking a partnership with communities um, and um, evaluating that piece is going to be, I think the one key evaluation is going to be how the candidates, how the IENs feel and how they're connected to the communities. Do you have a particular like evaluation framework for like, you know, if they're integrated for three months, touch base, six months, touch base? Or is that yes. Really so out? we've got, yeah. So we've got evaluation that um, evaluates at um, uh, after, I think after they arrive two weeks, okay. two weeks, prior at three months and at 12 months. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is talking about partnerships with housing. So are there any government of Alberta housing initiatives that could be started uh, to partner with and find temporary housing accommodation within these communities, just given the difficulty? Well, I'm Did not you know aware. <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware any government housing, um, but uh, what, I th what we're, what we're sensing is that um, not every house that's available in some of the communities is advertised. Mm -hmm. And one of my uh, staff member had a brilliant idea. And it's, it's an idea that we couldn't implement right up front, but I would love to share with the group here. And we know there are lots of seniors that live alone. Is, this an, is there could be a match here with these IENs. I think it's a brilliant idea. It's something we couldn't do it as an employer for their upfront housing, but it's certainly if seniors have been identified, uh, it's something that can be uh, sort of a transitional conversation after the candidates land. Um, and that can happen through the community connection. Um, I, I honestly think that's a really brilliant idea, but we'll just have to see how workable it is in different communities. Mm -hmm. And just to touch on that, there was a comment that, you know, many municipalities offer housing work with the local teams and they can help. So I would urge when Alberta Health Services is reaching out, uh, you know, you have an IEN coming is to ensure that they have those connections to, to work um, to work on that housing piece for sure. And Chandra, if we could get a list of that, uh, those municipalities, if there is such a list, that would be that would be fantastic. Uh, we know of some. But I, mm -hmm. I, you know, just a few we know, you know, for example, Provost is the community that comes to mind for me uh, mm -hmm. and they're getting a number of IEN. So they have some, but, you know, we're actually, I'm, I'm certainly not clear on how many other communities have some kind of housing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Another question here is, can you confirm that the community's responsibility essentially starts once they physically arrive into the community, we're unsure of any duties we need to take on prior to arrival. Yeah, nothing prior to arrival. I, I think expression of interest, um, um, getting the word out if the community has been identified, uh, though, you know, sometimes if we don't have a date, it's a little bit harder to have a conversation about it. But getting the word out that we will need housing support, transportation, um, where possible, I mean, the camp. IENs, once they get start paying, they can also, you know, pay for carpooling and things like that. But um, 
I would say nothing other than conversations prior to the IENs arriving. Once the IENs arrive, there are some key uh, supports we need. You know, the welcoming, you know, the IENs arrive, you know, probably by bus from Edmonton, um, you know, picking them up from the bus, taking them to their um, arranged accommodation, just kind of checking in with them. I mean, those are fantastic. There was a community member up at Peace River that picked up one of our IENs and, um, you know, took them for coffee and, uh, took him to his place and followed up next day. You know, that goes long ways. We, you know, we're human creatures. The connection is important. Uh, and it just cuts down the anxiety of an unknown new place. So that's a big one. Uh, housing, the welcoming. And then once people settle, especially if they have kids, just really just helping them, you know, to navigate a little bit about rural living. Um, so just mm -hmm. more informal support. Yeah, for sure. So I think it would be fair to say if you saw your community on the list where Fadumo shared um, and you're not entirely sure when they're coming, it would be, I would say, highly beneficial to start those conversations with your community groups on how you can help integrate and welcome IENs when they do come, right? So it's not such a hard and fast, well, we're getting them in, in three weeks, right? Or even a week uh, so that there is a plan in place. Great. Okay, we have one last question. I don't know if there's going to be more coming up in the chat, but um, have you looked into doing other bridging or international work? For example, paramedics, RNs, EM, EMTS, LPNs, et cetera, and bringing them from international? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so we've actually had a number of conversations with our, uh, with our uh, EMS uh, team, um, uh, colleagues um it's you know with ems and physiotherapy and some of the allied health it's not straight line uh, the the scope the qualifications are not uh the equivalency are not as clearly spelled out um where nursing is a long has long history you know canada actually only has about seven seven percent of our nurses are ienes where in other parts of the world, say Australia is like 30%, UK is like 28%. So um, well-established processes for credentialing and transitioning, not so for every group. Um, so we, we definitely have looked at EMS and there's some uh, early conversations going on, but there's EMSs can only recruit from a couple of places. That's the challenge because the education uh, our education and our requirements are very different, even within Canada. But the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, how does AHS pair IENs to potential mentors in nursing to help them transition? Yeah, so um, willingness, mentor saying I'm willing to be a mentor. Um, if, you know, somebody who was an IEN is definitely great, but not just IENs uh, for sure. Um, mentor is a mentor. Uh, so really looking at availability, willingness, you know, there's a few matching things we do. Uh, background sometimes is very helpful in terms of their nursing background. If somebody has a rural experience, fantastic, right? Uh, that's, you know, so those are the kind of things we look. Thank you. Uh, last question before I wrap up uh, is, can they do prudence exams and can we partner with colleges and work through it and how can we help advocate? Can you say that again? Sorry. They can do prudence exams and can we partner with colleges and work through it? How can we help advocate? I'm not sure I, I, I'm clear on the question. I'm sorry. I can take a jab at it, but... Um, <laughs> I'm not sure either. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I think it's important to understand... Um, so nursing, any other healthcare related, you always have to have continuing competency. You have to grow your skills and take courses and things like that. So these IENs will need that. And um, I, I think we won't have to do too much. Many of them are asking in the interview if this is available. Um, but they're coming in not needing bridging. I think that's really important to know. They're coming in and they've qualified. Uh, some of them have to write the exam because their country, they don't have the uh, NCLEX and in Canada, that's a requirement, um, but they have to, they've met the uh, credentialing. Uh, so there isn't further 
uh, post-secondary education required for them to, to work for us. Um, but I know many will be seeking their own growth, if I understood the question correctly. And it says, to do the follow-up, EMS does prudence exams when transferring. How can we help advocating for more IEN fields to be included? On EMS. The yeah, for I in fields, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. So, if I understood the question correctly, I will tell you we worked tirelessly with our regulatory college to make changes that are evidence based and part of the 21st century way of credentialing. And the changes have been made, and we're very grateful for it. And Alberta is benefiting from it. I would say starting with conversations with the college, the EMS college is a really good place to start. College's job is to protect the public. There's no public protection if the public can't get the service. So I think we need to shift the dialogue of what the purpose is. Yes, we wanna make sure the people we're credentialing are safe and have the qualification required, but we shouldn't be keeping people who could contribute to our workforce out because we we have these you know long standing ways of doing things that are not evidence based so i say starting with the college uh, is the place to go and despite my accent i'm actually an alberta graduate so i can't speak from experience but uh, i can tell you what we've learned through our work work with the college that's great thank you so just in the interest of time i'm going to do one more question um, as I think it's quite pertinent and it's a good one to, to end on. Uh, so are the mentors going to be from the community the IEN is in? And if someone was interested in being a mentor, who should they contact? Oh my goodness. Well, I would say, uh, please contact. Um, Paula, can you please put, uh, um, actually Shonda, you have our IEN email. The ACNO one? Yes. Yeah, it's in the chat. Please contact ACNO IEN um, email. We that is the ideal if you're in the community. That would be a fantastic match. Uh, but even if you're not in the community and you would like to help uh, as a mentor, we would uh, greatly, uh, gladly accept that. So I want to extend a huge thank you to you, Fidimo, for sharing the process of the IENs, answering the questions. I know that this is a project that is in dire need and I know that there's kinks to be worked out and there will be no success if AHS and community if we don't band together and ensure that these IENs are happy healthy and feel integrated so thank you very much I know that many have um, gotten their questions answered and I'm sure that there will be more questions that will pop up but uh, I'm happy to come back, great. Shanda. It's yes, been yes. a pleasure. It, we have a beautiful province and we have a lot to offer and we just need to get out there and get the right candidates and, and support them to stay. Thank you for the honor of being with you today. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you.